Good evening, Salem. Uh, this is Pastor. Thank you again for joining in in our Wednesday night Bible study. Of course, this is our spring break, so I hope in the midst of your fun in the sun and your relaxation that you have time for a word from the Lord. If you can't view it tonight, I pray that you would view this message throughout your week, at some point during the week, uh, to remind us what Christian discipleship is all about. Again, thank you to all of our ministerial staff, uh, Dr. Lee, Reverend Wheeler, Reverend Sanders, Ministry Net, and those who have taken on the burden of the teaching on a weekly basis of Christian discipleship. I want to continue with that thought and that theme as we look at a familiar book of the Old Testament, the book of Ruth, because I believe Ruth gives us a clear example of what Christian discipleship in terms of commitment really is all about. As you can see, I'm in the upstairs of our, in our youth department. As you can see, the new uh, smart television monitors have been installed and awaiting our children as we uh, return safely. Uh, it's gonna really upgrade and change the way uh, we use technology in terms to teach uh, and to make disciples. If you will go with me in prayer as we uh, prepare to study the word of God together. Father, we're grateful. We ask that you bless us as we continue to study, to preach, and teach your word. And most of all, that we may share the gospel and that we will make disciples. Amen. The gospel that is <laughs> so used in the New Testament, the book of Ruth, chapter 1, verse 1. Notice the historical context is mentioned. Now it came to pass in those days uh, when the judges ruled. Of course, the judges are temporary leaders that we see highlighted in the book of Judges in the Old Testament. It is these leaders who are temporary military leaders, civic leaders, prophets, in the case of Deborah, who are in charge of reminding the children of Israel uh, about their commitment to God. And so whenever uh, the children of Israel became disobedient, fell into idolatry. God sent uh, a plague, and that plague was not in terms of what we see in the book of Exodus in terms of the Exodus experience, the plague of frog and fly, but he sent a plague in terms of an enemy would rise up, whether it be the Amorites, the Jubasites, and all of these individuals will come um, and attack the nation of Israel, and then they, God will raise up a temporary judge once they are repentant and reminded that their success is in their relationship with God, and then God will bring up a temporary judge. In the case of most famously Gideon, the Midianites came and overwhelmed Israel to the point that they were hiding in caves. God raised up Gideon and his 300 that allowed Gideon to, under the power of God, to push out the Midianites uh, away uh, from the land of Israel. So during this time, that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of the Benjamin, Benjamin Judah went to Sir John in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was uh, Emilich, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the name of his two sons were Milon and Chilion, uh, Epaphrodites of uh, Benjamin, uh, Bethlehem, Judea, excuse me. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Emily, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. One of the names was Ophrah and the name of the other Ruth, and they dwelled there a total of 10 years. And Milion and Chilion died, also both of them, and the women were left of her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughter-in-law that she might return to the country of Moab. And she, for she had heard that the country of Moab, how the Lord had visited his people and given them Bread. Let's stop right there and talk about Christian discipleship in terms of commitment. When Naomi and Emily go into the city of Moab, they go to find bread because there was a famine in the town of Bethlehem. And so because there was a famine, it was traditionally that whenever there was a famine, because remember this is a desert region, you would go to kind of the fertile lands 
to find food. So they go to Moab and they don't find food. Actually, they find death and they find, find themselves destitute. And so once they get there, the Bible says in verse 4 that her two sons uh, take on Moabite women by the name of Ophrah and Ruth. And they dwell there 10 years. Culturally, we have to understand this, that at this time, a woman, unfortunately, had very little status by herself. Her provision, her provision and her protection was really the responsibility of her husband. Now, we may disagree with that, but we may see um, that in the biblical uh, context, this was a reality. And so that's why we see Ruth and Ophrah being married to Milion and Chilion for 10 years. So at 10 years, their pro protection and their provision was the responsibilities of their husbands. You must understand that. Uh, because if you don't, you really miss why it was such a tragedy when their husband died. And so when we know that for 10 years, they were covered by their husband. But the Bible says in verse 5 that both of them died. Now their father, Emily, has died, leaving Naomi uncovered. Uh, Emily, Milion, and Chilion had died, leaving Ophrah and Ruth uncovered. So now we have three women who are uncovered. They have no protection and no provision. Let's talk about relationship. At this time, historically and culturally, when it comes to your provision and your protection, it was the responsibility of your husband. And so when you married, your provisions were based on your relationship. Your provisions were based on your relationship. First point, I want you to write this down. Often provisions uh, is either a benefit or a basis of relationship. Provision is either a benefit or a basis of relationship. Let me talk about those two things. If provision is the basis of relationship, then verse 5 is a tragedy of life. If the only reason why you are in relationship is what you get out of it is the provision, then your commitment level is very low. When it comes to Christian discipleship, too often our commitment is based on provision. Another word for provision is compensation. What do I get out of it? Compensation is not simply monetarily. It's not just money. Compensation can be accolades, it can be uh, the applause, it can be sitting in positions of honor. For example, if you're an associate minister, an accolade or a provision could be sitting in the pulpit, if we want to look at it practically. It could be a position where I'm a deacon, I sit on the front row of the congregation. It could be as a leader, I get my name called, I get my picture on the wall somewhere, I get my name in the bulletin. These are provision. But the question is, is your commitment based upon that or is that just a benefit? Is the provision a benefit or a basis of your commitment? Is the provision a benefit or the basis of your commitment? A disciple is not committed based on the provision. It's not based on the provision. It is a benefit of it, but it's not the basis. It's not the basis of it. If you remember a story in John chapter 10, let's go there. If you go to the Gospel of John chapter 10, you will see this bared out. Jesus gives the parable of the shepherd and the hireling. The hireling is somebody who is hired or paid to watch the sheep. The shepherd is somebody who has a relationship with the sheep. And in verse number 12, it says, well, verse 11, uh, I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd give us his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling or hired hand, an employee, and not the shepherd, who's on the sheep or not, Seeketh, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catches them, and scattereth the sheep. Verse 13, the hireling fleeth, because he is a hireling, and cares not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and have known of mine. What he's saying is that the hireling, the uh, quote-unquote employee for a better 
uh, for lack of a better phrase, is only the protection of the sheep as long as the provision is greater than the threat. When the wolf comes, the hireling says, this is not worth it. I'm not going to you know, fight, fight wolves for, for some sheep that I'm only getting a few dollars to watch. I'm not going to do that. If your commitment level is only based upon compensation, then it leaves you to decide if the compensation is worth the risk or even if the compensation is worth the provision. Is the compensation worth, I'm sorry, is the compensation worth the sacrifice? You see, a disciple must understand that we are not faithful by compensation because of this compensation, now we have to get into a, uh, almost a monetarily compensation. This is a business arrangement. Does my compensation match my commitment level? You see. This may work in corporate America, but it doesn't work very effectively in terms of Christian ministry. Because most of us work or are committed to God, not because we've been hired, but because we've been called. And when we're called into Christian service and Christian duty and the role of a disciple, we realize that our reward, although it's good to get compensation on this side, is not the basis of our calling. The basis of our calling is in our relationship with God. It's in our relationship with God. And if you want to know the difference between those who take this disciple, uh, the, who is a Christian disciple and somebody who's just involved in, in work, if you will, is when the compensation leaves. Can you continue to work when no one recognizes you? Can you continue to be commitment when there's no compensation? Can you continue to be commitment, particularly in this time, in which there's no one in the building, no one sees the work you're doing, no one sees the sacrifice, can you still be committed? Can you still be committed to your ministry even when your ministry is in an active right now? That's a sign of Christian commitment because the tendency is if there is no provision, no comp uh, compensation, then the commitment level goes down. But the sign of a Christian disciple is that even in the midst of disruptions, you're not distracted. You realize that your calling is to God. And when your calling is to God, then your commitment never wavers based on compensation or provision. And we see this particularly when it comes to Ruth's commitment to her mother-in-law, Naomi. In verse number seven, it says, wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was with her two daughters and laws with her, and they were, they went, on the way and return to the land of Judah. Naomi says it to her two daughters-in-law, go and return to her mother's house. Each of their mother's house. You're uncovered as long as you're with me. There's no provision if you're with me. There's no compensation if you're with me. Go back home. Go back home. And the Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. But verse 9 says, the Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Go find your kingdom redeemer. Go find your redeemer. Now, I, I got to tell you this. I know this is Christian discipleship, but the kingdom's redeemer work like this in the book of, in the Bible. That if a husband died, the closest relative is what we call the kinsman redeemer. Okay. So, for example, if my brother died, and I pray he does, if my brother dies and he's married, it is now my responsibility to care for his wife and his children. That's the law of the kinsman redeemer. That the wife and the family are not uncovered when death takes the husband away. Go back and find the closest relatives of your husband and they may cover you. She kissed them. They observe their voice as well. She does not denigrate them, nor does she put them down for going back home. She encourages them because she says, I can't compensate you. I, I'm too old. Even if I get married again, I can have children that can grow up quick enough for you to marry, that can provide for you. It's the provision. You need to be covered. But verse 11 says, and they only turn again to her daughters, uh, particularly, and says, why will you go with me? 
Are there yet more sons in my womb that they may be your husband? Turn again, my daughters, go your way. I'm too old to have a husband. And if I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight and should bear children, would you tarry? Will you wait until they are grown? But Ruth says, in the midst of a situation with no compensation, she says in verse 14, and they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Ophra kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth cleaved unto her. The word cleave is, different, is interesting because it means to follow closely. It means to keep close. It's a word that, that's spatial. It describes space. Uh, to cleave is, is like this. Let no space come between you. You remember this, this language in the marriage Bible. Even in the beginning of the book of Exodus, so a man shall leave his wife, his mother and father, and what? Cleave unto his wife to stay closely. Let nothing come between them. Let nothing separate them. Ruth says, Naomi, I'm going to be committed to you, not for the provision, but the level of my commitment is to be shown that I will let nothing come between me and you. Now that's important. Christian discipleship, if you're going to be steadfastly minded and faithful, you got to let nothing come between you and your commitment. Now, let me be clear. When I say let nothing come between you and your commitment, is never let the lack of something come between you. The lack of compensation. The lack of appreciation. The lack of applause. The lack of recognition. All of these are things that we all desire to have. We all want to be recognized. Who doesn't? We all want to be appreciated. Who doesn't? But what Christian discipleship says is that's not the reason I'm committed. That's not the reason I am committed. I want to show you something in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 it says, particularly in verse number, uh, I'm sorry, in Romans, excuse me, in Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, verse 35, Romans chapter 8, verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who shall separate us, get in between us? Shall tribulation or distress, persecution or famine or nakedness or perils or soul? As it's written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors to him that loves us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor other, any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul says, I'm going to list the things that tend to have a tendency to separate us from Family, that's in the book of Ruth. Nakedness, lack of provision, peril, trouble, soul, battle for war. For that sake, we'll kill all of that. He says, nothing is, nothing is strong enough to break my commitment with God. And when you're in ministry, when you're a Christian disciple, that should be our standard. That nothing, no opposition, no struggle, no instances is greater than my commitment to God. A Christian discipleship allows nothing to separate them from their commitment. She follows closely. That's the basis of verse 16. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave, nor to return from thee, for whether thou go, I go. No separation. No spatial separation. And whether thou lodgest, you see, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. No relationship. And thy God shall be my God. No matter of faith. Ruth loses everything. Ruth is a Moabite. She comes from a pagan society. But she says, your people will be mine. Your God will be mine. There is nothing that is going to separate me and you. But notice the length of her commitment. We've seen the depth of it in verse 16. Notice the length of it in verse 17. Whether thou diest, will I die? And whether I be buried, 
and the Lord do so to me and more also if I ought but depart thee and me. She said, my commitment to you is for a lifetime. How interesting is that when we commit ourselves to God, the Bible says, particularly in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 10, be thy faithful unto death. A Christian disciple is not just faithful uh, for one year, not just faithful for a term, but it's faithful unto death because that's what God requires. In verse 18, it says, when she saw and she was steadfastly minded to go with her, that she left speaking unto her. In other words, she stopped trying to persuade her not to come. Verse 18 is so important. And when she saw that Ruth was steadfastly minded. Let's look at a few passages of scripture that speaks to being steadfastly minded. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 8, 58. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brother, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abiding in the work of the Lord, knowing for, for so has much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Be ye steadfast. That's the commitment. Unmovable. Nothing shall persuade you to go one way or the other. Abiding. Abiding in the work of the Lord. Knowing that you know that your labor is not in vain. Ruth had to know that her commitment to Naomi was not going to be thrown away. That her commitment to Naomi was not something minuscule, was not something small was not something that was not beneficial. Ruth says, I'm going to be steadfastly minded. What does it mean to be steadfastly minded? It's right there, to be unmovable, not wavering in your commitment. Our chairman, Brother Alton Levine, has one of his favorite passages, is a man putting his hand to the plow, looking back, is not fit for the kingdom of God. What does that mean? Is that if I put my hand to work, if I get my, uh, put myself in a position to be committed, but I'm regretting my decision, I'm wishing that I'm, I was back where I was, uh, it's an agricultural image. You can't plow in a field looking backwards. You got to plow looking forward so that the roles may be straight. And if you're going to be committed to God, you got to be looking forward, not behind you. You can't be trying to move forward while you're wishing you were back where you were. Christian commitment is that, thank you, the Apostle Paul said, I press for the mark, for the prize of the high calling. Forgetting those things that are behind me, I press forward. Psalms number one puts it like this. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners. Um, what? Let's read, let's read. Uh, this is Bible study. Psalms number one, go there. Psalms number one, right after the book of Job. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law does he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree, what? Planted, unmovable, by the rivers of water, spatial. He's planted, he's not moving. He's close to the source of water. Let nothing separate you. And bring it forth his fruit in his season, his leaves shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Because of where he's planted, he always has provision. Because of where he's planted, whatever he doeth prospers. Christian commitment. If you want to talk about the benefits, when you maintain your commitment to God, God will maintain his commitment to you. And not only in Psalms 1, but in the book of John, he says, I am the true vine. Ye the branch, if you're connected to me, you shall produce much fruit. If you're connected with God and you are unmovable in your connection with God, God will provide for you provision. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28. The Bible says very clearly, if you keep my commandments, I will bless you beyond measure. 
I'm going to bless you beyond measure. The provisions is not the basis for the relationship, but it's the benefits of the relationship. Okay? If I'm steadfast minded, that means I maintain my position. I don't. Number one, I maintain my position. Number two, there's nothing that can separate me from my commitment. So they went and came to Bethlehem. It came to pass when they came to Bethlehem that the city was moved and they said, is this Naomi? And Naomi, because of the depths of her depression, says, call me Mara, which means bitterness. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Although I know Naomi's feelings is not the subject of our discussion this evening, but I must speak to it to be honest with the text. Naomi has lost everything. She has lost her husband. She has lost her two sons. She has lost her provision. She is now destitute. She is now in poverty. She is now homeless. She has nothing. She leaves in search of food, but she finds only bitterness. And so she returns. And she says, don't call me Naomi, but call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. Naomi makes a rational decision to leave Bethlehem, which means the house of bread, and seek provision in Moab. It was not that God had dealt bitterly with her. It's the fact that she's dealing with the ramifications of a decision that she made to find provision outside of the land of Israel. She goes to Moab. Yes, she finds Ruth there. All things do work together for good. But the depths of Naomi's depression is so severe that she says, because of what I experienced, I have changed my identity. I must tell you, never allow any experience to change who you are. That's what Naomi does. When she allows life to change her, she now identifies herself by her experience. Never identify yourself by life experience, you see. That is very dangerous because it leads to the depth of depression that is hard to get out of. We all have life experiences that are difficult, but we cannot allow that experience to define us. You know, one of the, I wish they would come up with words for like ex-offender. Yes, I was incarcerated. But now don't tag me for the rest of my life as an ex-defender. Because what people hear is not ex, they hear defender. They hear that I am offended. They hear that I was incarcerated. You see? Don't be defined by the tragedies of life. Don't be defined by that. Um, so Ruth is committed. So steadfastly minded means that we got to stay in position. It means that our blessings are not the basis of our commitment, but it's all the benefits of it. And we ought to be faithful unto death, even into the face of the unknown. Who would have known that ministry leaders will be leading during this time of ministry when you cannot meet physically? We have to adjust on the fly, but we cannot just stop leading. We cannot say, well, Sunday school stops, youth department stops, you know, brotherhood stops. No, we have to lead in different ways because we are committed to who? We're not committed to Salem, we're committed to God. And in this relationship with Ruth and Naomi, Ruth is committed to Naomi, but ultimately Ruth's commitment to Naomi is based upon her commitment to God. My commitment to Salem as pastor is not only uh, to say them but based upon my commitment to God. I'm committed to God so I'm committed to his church and so that maintains my commitment. When we are Christian disciples it is our commitment to God that is the basis of our commitment to ministry and discipleship that is our commitment to everyday life. If you apply this principle to everything and not just spiritual things then we'll find life becomes a lot better. 
I'm committed to God, so I'm committed to my wife. I'm committed to God, so I'm committed to my husband. I'm committed to God, so I'm committed to my children. I'm committed to God, so I'm committed to my ministry. I'm committed to God, so I'm committed to my church. And when I'm committed to my church, I'm, I, I do these things. I worship, I give, I support, I pray. All of that is based on my commitment to God. But when something begins to separate my commitment from God, then everything else falls apart. Everything else falls apart. It's like the gospel. If Jesus does not, is not physically, bodily, resurrected from the dead, everything else falls apart. If we are not committed because of our relationship with God, everything, every commitment in life falls apart. Because it is God that gives us the strength to maintain our commitment. Steadfastly minded. One of the most powerful scriptures, and I will leave you with this, is in the book of Philippians, chapter 2. And it says, Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that is the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Of things in heaven and things of earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What is the message here? The message is that if we want to be steadfastly minded, our commitment must never be able to be separated. Our commitment is never based on compensation. It is never based on provision. It is based on a relationship with God. And when you are in a relationship with God, you can be steadfastly minded, unmoved, always abiding in the work of the law. I pray that this message has been helpful. And as you enjoy your spring break and your time of relaxation and recuperation, I pray that you continue to keep God in the front of everything that you do. Be a Christian disciple. Christian disciple. Be steadfastly minded. Remember, everything we do is saying is to spread the gospel and make disciples. And I got news for you. God has so much more in store. May God bless you and may God keep you is my prayer. Thank you.